finally got your first leadership gig, loving the new role, but feeling the pressure of your new responsibilities and all that expectation to perform? Well, don't worry, you're not alone. Crossing the chasm from a technical role to leadership, from doing stuff to managing and leading people is the toughest challenge any leader must make. Welcome to the Human Edge Show, the podcast dedicated to help you do just that, successfully cross the doing to leading chasm. Campbell Such here, Chief Chasm Crossing Guide. I've made all the mistakes so you don't have to. I want to help you learn those lessons much more easily by sharing my experiences and talking with brilliant people who have already figured it out. You'll get great actionable tips, strategies and techniques to make the transition so much easier and faster for you. Now let's get to it. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Human Edge Show. Today, I'm really privileged to have Mark Watkins from JumpShift on the show. Mark, welcome. Great to have you with us. Likewise, Campbell. Yeah, I've been really looking forward to this. And uh, we've known each other for a wee while. And so great to see you and your business thriving. And uh, just fantastic to be part of the show, sharing some stuff, hopefully, that will help people right now. Fantastic. Thank, thanks for coming on. It's just it's great to have you. Uh, Mark Watkins is... Vice President Sales and Delivery for JumpShift. Mark is a professional certified executive coach, coaching supervisor, trainer, and facilitator. And I can tell you from my experience with Mark, he's outstanding at all of those. He was one of the JumpShift's first customers and having been inspired by the JumpShift approach, it was only a matter of time before he joined the team. He's worked across industries with companies within New Zealand, such as Air New Zealand, Auckland Transport, Fonterra, which is uh, the connection that I first had with, with Mark through another connection I had in Fonterra, Southern Cross and Spark, as well as global organizations such as Cisco, Coca-Cola, Hellenic, Draeger, IBM, Nokia, Logica, and Siemens. Wow, Siemens, that takes me a long way back to one of my first jobs that I ever got was working for a, an organization in New Zealand um, selling Siemens electronic components. And there you go. There you go. Prior to immigrating to New Zealand with his family of now four children, Mark ran his own coaching company in the UK for six years. So, Mark, welcome. Just to start off, what's one thing that not too many people would know about you? Well, and you'll get used to me through the interview. I'm not very good at following rules. So, uh, it'll be three things. Um, <clears throat> first is I actually used to speak Dutch better than English. I grew up in uh, Rotterdam or Rotterdam, and uh, so from the age of one till seven, I'd walk out the door and speak Dutch and walk back in and speak English, and I could sneakily get away with using some naughty words that my parents didn't know because they were English, so um, that was one claim to fame. Another rather weird one was I could do the splits until I was about 25. I used to do some gymnastics when I was younger. Um, and the third, some have come across this uh, this approach. I, I still play the trombone uh, in a local big band. So uh, play a bit of jazz and stuff. And so we occasionally do gigs. So yeah, get the trombone out, but generally have to uh, uh, wipe the dust off it because it's quite a bit of a break between every single time I play. So yeah, a few bits there. Well, wow, that's amazing. You have to get, you have to get warm up the lips too, I guess, for the trombone, right? To get that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Maybe good practice for an interview. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, you've look, you've had a you, you've had a, a long experience across you know a, a number of industries and and through different roles that you've um, that you've had through your career and you're now involved deeply in the whole leadership space. Can, uh, one of the things that uh, that I'm really interested in is is understanding that big challenge that that so many leaders, or almost all leaders, have is making that first step into leadership. Can you just take me take us back to your early days in leadership, your first forays into into a leadership role, and just talk a little bit about what was the environment that led to that that change, and what did you do that that helped helped make things work for you? And are there any missteps that you made that you that you'd uh, that you'd advise uh, new leaders to consider uh, that that might help them make that that transition a bit more easily? Yeah, I'll give it a go. Um... We often think of leaders as being anyone in um, in their work or personal lives that in some way make a difference to someone else through their actions, through their deeds, through their approach. And uh, so quite early on, I was um, kind of nudged into semi-leadership roles in some more community-type things I was involved with um, in my team. So scouts and 
the music. Um, I set up a little trombone quartet that got the section of the trombonists to practice together, but we ended up competing in the national finals. So we put in a whole bunch of practice and developed our skills. And so um, I'd often have an idea and be good at kind of wrapping some people around me for the idea. Um, uh, same with scouts. I remember being a, like a patrol leader on a camp and uh, I had quite a <laughs> quite a rogue group of young lads uh, in, in the group that I was part of or in the patrol. And uh, we were languishing in last place um, for the kind of awards and the credits that you got on the way. And I kind of gave them a choice. Hey, guys, we can completely DOS the entire holiday and just have a scream. And I'm totally up for that. Or we can try and win this thing and be the underdog that kind of comes good at the end. And uh, so just giving people that choice. I've always uh, been someone that seems to get on with people, whatever age, stage in life. And even remember at 14 talking to uh, uh, my best friend's mum. She was in the process of going through a divorce. And I was working for her and her husband <laughs> in a shop. And uh, she gave me a lift home one day and just like started sharing some stuff. So coaching and listening and understanding what's going on for people has kind of always been part of my uh, my makeup and my approach. And so I think the first more formal leadership role I stepped into um, was setting up my own business. And uh in the process of getting there, one of the biggest fears I had, ironically, given I'm on your show and I, I'm MC and a facilitator and all that sort of stuff, um, was the fear of speaking in public. And uh, and so I ended up putting myself through a number of training courses run by an organization called Carnegie. They were well known for developing people's confidence through public speaking. And so for me, that kind of monumental first time that I really felt uh, that I was supporting the growth and development of others was the first time I was an instructor for that program. And, uh, you know, the participants, they kind of looked at me very comfortable at the front thinking that, well, it's easy for you to say because you've obviously always found it comfortable speaking in public and and actually then sharing the story of how terrified I'd been and how hard I'd had to work to get to the point that I was able to work with them on the same stuff gave a real connection and empathy with the audience and still remember the final session would always get them to invite friends, family, bosses, colleagues. There's about 100 to 150 people in the room and and the participants. And as long as my focus was on them, I didn't get the eebie-jeebies about the much larger group. So it's that kind of, uh, when I'm in service to other people, it's not about me anymore. And for me, that's what actually leadership it's all about. Um, are you setting up your people to do the very best work of their lives? Uh, and if your focus is on them being the number one customer, they'll treat your end customer in the same way that they're experiencing being treated through your leadership. Yeah. Wow. So with with uh, with um, your public speaking, you went to a you went to a Carnegie course and then ended up running and facilitating and leading leading those courses. It's, yeah, yeah. That was a major <laughs> milestone for me. Yeah, that is a major milestone, and for, and for so many of us, uh, the idea of getting up on stage and speaking in front of even a small group of people um, is something that that most of us really, really challenge with. So good on you for pushing through that. That's awesome, and then and then being able to to build that empathy and and understand that uh, that the best leaders are <laughs> leading through helping others and and looking outwards rather than necessarily looking inwards. So for a for a, a for a technical person, a te- say a technology expert, someone who's built their career in their toolbox of of getting stuff done, tools is now offered the position or an opportunity to move into leadership. What would you say to them if you were advising them around the things that they should think about in those first thirty to ninety days of a of a new leadership role? What what what, what would what would make a difference and what would help things, you know, especially with this idea of, of looking outwards rather than looking inwards because it's so easy to look inwards and and, um, and perhaps get take the wrong approach. What would you be saying to someone who's in that new role around what they should think about mm. and their approach? Well, probably um, kind of putting their white belt back on as we uh, kind of a martial arts metaphor of you may have got to the black belt, but put your white belt back on and be in learner mode. So, 
Um, but rather than learning about necessarily the technical aspects of the role, which you probably got down pat, it's learning about the team. What makes the team tick? Um, kind of why do you exist as a team? Who are your key stakeholders? Who are the people around you that you need to deliver results to? And uh, it's almost like a customer survey, finding out from your team what they expect of you as their leader, um, talking about what you expect of them, so setting those expectations up. And the same with any internal um, customers, other teams that you're engaging with. What do they love about working with your team? What are the things that you could do to lift and improve what you're doing to deliver more value to them? Um, so really that first three to six months is get to know the rhythm of the team, the working approach, the outcomes they're trying to achieve and what makes them tick. And to be really open around um, them having conversations about what's working, what isn't. I think most go into a leadership role thinking that they need to know all the answers and that they're you know, invulnerable, bulletproof. I've got to prove to everyone I'm really awesome at this. Whereas the best leaders are the ones that are um, vulnerable, I actually say, I don't know, and spend the time understanding and getting context. Of course, sharing technical insight and wisdom where you've got it, real value add and builds credibility. Um, but the hardest shift is moving off the tools whether it's making widgets or coding yourself or whatever it was that your specialism was, uh, which is the what of your role. We often draw a little triangle. The thick side of the what is all about what you came into the role to be great at, being measured on your ability to do that job, the what. And then the shift, the tough part, is that chasm that you talk about, which is uh, moving to how. So we used to get our endorphin hit from getting stuff done, which was measurable, and then we now need to help other people to get that stuff done, which is the how, which is the, the wedge that grows as you go through your career that you need to move across to. And uh, letting go of the um, dopamine hit you used to get for getting stuff done and instead looking to trigger the dopamine hit through seeing other people meet their potential, uh, grow, develop um, and make some mistakes on the way, but be there to help them learn from the mistake and then really develop and grow fast. Yeah. And and recognize that it's not just about them that they're learning and growing too. It's about you learning and growing in your in your leadership role, right? And uh, I think it was Diana Taylor that that said in a previous interview, she talked about someone that had said to her she'd she was coming out of a technical role into a leadership role. And they said that this mentor of hers had said, Hey, you got this toolbox full of how of doing stuff tools. Um, but over there, that toolbox, that leadership management toolbox, that's empty, and you've got to you've got to fill that toolbox with the new tools and recognise that um, that's your job and not not doing stuff anymore. And that, that's really insightful about the dopamine hit of getting things done. Uh, you know, I've been there. I think most of us as leaders, when we move off the tools or start to move off the tools, because the early the early roles are not necessarily completely away from the tools, but you're starting to make a move into more getting some stuff done yourself and also, you know, in a team lead role, for example, and, and then helping to helping the team deliver things. So how do you, how do you help people recognize when they're, um, they've still got that dopamine hit of getting stuff done and to recognize that it's, it's helping others that it's really going to make the biggest, the biggest difference. Cause if you do it yourself, it's that's all you can do. But if you help three other people do it, even if it's not as well as you've done it or are doing it, you can help them get better at it. But it's three times stuff getting done rather than one time stuff getting done. How do you help people? Because you, you talk about two triangles: one, the, the technical thing, which you know goes this way, and then there's the learning those new set of skills. How do you get people across there? How do you get across that chasm? Well, it, it's never one silver bullet, right? Because uh, different strokes for different folks. But often we'll uh, share insights and and kind of get them thinking about what might be possible if they are able to um, help engage their team fully and empower them. Um, for some leaders, it's getting them to reflect on when they were in, in that role. So back when you were there, what did you love about bosses that really uh, help you to do the best work of your life? And what was the stuff that used to frustrate the hell out of you? And most will talk about micro micromanagement, having been micromanaged or poorly delegated to, not trusted, not fully empowered, not feeling valued. And so, right, well, if that didn't work for you, it probably won't work for other people either. So what's the other thing that you can do instead then to really lift them? There's a lot of research. I know for some people, 
particularly if they're more technically minded, they want to know the research behind it. Is this a proven fact? So we often reference, there was a guy, Patrick Lencioni, years ago that wrote a book called The Three Signs of a Miserable Job. He did some interviews on on Harvard and, and elsewhere talking about those three signs and how prevalent they are in the workforce. Um, anonymity, if people, uh, if the leader doesn't even recognize you as a human being with what's going on, um, irrelevance, you can't see how your role makes a difference to other people around you. And in measurement, which is if you can't measure whether you're doing a good job, it's really hard to stay motivated. So that's one way. Um, more recent research from Google, they did a whole bunch of work around Project Oxygen that was uh, basically what do the best bosses do? And about 80% of the stuff on that list of things is about coaching and enabling. There's one item on the list of 10 that they shared from all the research around what people love their bosses as enablers doing. That one thing was provide technical input where the team needs it. But it was one of 10, a tenth of the time. The rest was all coaching and supporting and building the vision with the team and enabling and supporting them in uh, long-going or ongoing development conversations. And the other thing, like little stories that come to mind, I mean, I'll often like tongue in cheek, a bit of a sense of humor when I'm running training to say, you know, your team will absolutely love you as a boss if you fix all of their problems. Of course they will, but then you're doing their job for them. Yeah. Now, uh, we use the monkey metaphor. So when your team comes up to you and they've got a problem, it's like they've got a monkey sat on their shoulder. They start talking to you about their problem and the little monkey runs down their arm, hops across your desk and hops up on your shoulder. Now, if you've already got 15 of your own monkeys and you've got a team of 10, each sharing two or three monkeys each with you, you'll end up with 30 to 40 monkeys on your shoulders. And if they stay there for long, they make a hell of a mess. So we always say coaching's the antidote to monkeys. It's a way of asking questions to get the person to fix, solve, own their own monkey. So you transfer responsibility back to them. And then they're working on their monkeys and you can work on the more strategic ones. Otherwise, yeah, much as they love it, they'll always come to you as the answer person. They won't come to you um, to really develop and grow. So we've got to kind of undo that habit. Yeah. Yeah, looking, <clears throat> I always see it as a as a line of people standing outside your door with take a number. And if you're having to make all those decisions and give all the answers, then you just built this massive pressure for yourself. And the stories that I hear of of leaders that have new leaders in, in leadership roles that are trying to do it the way they always did it, which is do stuff as opposed to help other people get stuff done, end up the pressure just grows and grows and grows and grows. And the number of times I've seen the results of that, which is just overwhelmed, burn, this right? pressure, yeah. all of that stuff, right? And then and then no way, and there's no way back and not necessarily support from from above and a feeling of, well, I've just got to do this. And then ultimately they work out that. It's too much, and they leave. And you've, and often because it's the best practitioner that's been put into that role, you've lost not just the best practitioner, but some, you know, all of the other stuff that goes around losing someone out of your team. Um, you talked about coaching, and to me, coaching is a massive piece of leadership that that's, I guess, becoming more and more understood. Uh, but not many of us know how to do it, and uh, it's so easy to have someone come and talk to you about a problem that they've got. And I love the monkey metaphor. That's just awesome. And grab the monkey or recognize that there is a monkey, but give advice uh, that then helps them, that, that, that takes the responsibility away from them for solving the problem, as opposed to putting it back onto them to solve their own problem and keep their monkeys. So um, how do you go about helping someone make that change from their technical role, which was advice and doing stuff and being the smartest person to leading and helping other people to take their own advice and work it out for themselves. Yeah, and it is uh, it is hard. I mean, there's the good thing to know. It's hard to make the transition. Um, we, we used to do a little exercise around getting people to talk about in pairs. One person talks about something that they're passionate about. And then the other person, um, their goal is to listen <laughs> and listen so much that they're drawing more out of the person than they may have expected themselves to share. 
And then when we debrief the exercise, we're like, oh, yeah, how was it? How was the listening? Oh, yeah, it was awesome. Really interesting to find out about the other person. <clears throat> right. And what happens as you start to get a sense of a, uh, the conversation and what they're sharing? And, you know, how do you notice when there's a connection? Oh, I, you know, I start to notice similar things in my life to what the other person's got. Right. And so as soon as you notice similar things in what's going on in your life, what's the next temptation to do? Well, to start telling them about them, right? Uh, I don't know if you remember the tubes in in London, the UK. They always have this little announcement as you come in, mind the gap. We talk about that gap. It's instead of the attention being in your listening to the other person, you're now thinking about your own stories. And then even worse, you're jumping into that hole or that gap and sharing those stories. And so it's a human inclination. And it's even more so when... We're really good at that stuff, that technical stuff that they're talking about. And the danger is we take away the value, the learning, the opportunity of helping the other person to solve the problem for themselves. So um, there's a couple of things. I don't know if you mind me sharing a slide on this one. There's a try to boil down a four-day coaching program into four minutes or less, but no doubt you'll keep me on the timer for this one. Okay, um, go ahead. A little bit of research that's just pra that I just referenced. So one from uh, Deloitte around uh, coaching and the impact of coaching, uh, they knew that the results were significantly higher, but as they highlight here, it's where leaders frequently made an effort to coach. It wasn't where they said, um, I'm a brilliant coach. I've gone through thousands of hours of training. I'm professionally certified. No, they just made an effort. They had an intention to coach. On the um, the Project Oxygen, there was a whole bunch of stuff in green here that relates directly to coaching approaches. Amber is a little bit more of a mix of you could tell people or you could ask them. And then the only one that's a direct input is that number eight, the technical skills to advise. So um, we share a little model called Coaching Alchemy that kind of breaks down what actually is humanly easy and possible for us all to do, but in more simple terms. So um, on the left-hand side, you've got this little yin-yang model with the being and doing side. Uh, if I talk through the being bit, um, your intent is the number one thing that makes a difference to whether coaching is going to be effective. And most people focus their learning on what are the questions I need to ask. Well, humans have bullshit detectors and they'll know whether you care about their answers or not and whether you're even listening, right? And so if you believe your people are Muppets, they'll respond like that. I've had so many leaders on a leadership program come back from a course and go, wow, my team comes up with so many amazing ideas. Well, they haven't changed. It's just you and you're listening to them now. So you need to believe they've got stuff to contribute that's valuable. Now, you can't do any coaching if you're not present. And the entire world is designed, particularly with these things, mobile phones, laptops, notifications, back-to-back -back meetings, are designed to make us anything but present. Yeah. So being present is critical. How do I stay in the moment? Because then I can coach effectively. And, you know, if you can see in others that glazed look, you know, the lights are on but nobody's home, then probably they can see it in you when you're not listening anymore. You're thinking about the solution. So if you're present, you can build that trust and rapport. That's the connection. You'd be the best coach in the world. But if they don't trust and don't have a, a connection with you, then the chances of them opening up and sharing what's really going, uh, going on is slim to zero. So that's the being side. And actually, that's the foundation and more important than any of the doing stuff that you might learn on a training. On the doing side, that listening we just shared, really critical. Uh, you can't coach if you're not listening to someone else's uh, reflections and thinking. There's a whole book written by a lady called Nancy Klein called Time to Think, where she says the quality of your listening directly impacts the quality of thinking of the other person. Mm -hmm. Quality of listening directly impacts the quality of thinking of the other person. And I mean, that's boiling down a whole book into one sentence, but it kind of gives you the gist. Yep. Then you need to create some follow-up <laughs> questions and from time to time summarize. Just check in that you're on the same page but you're not summarizing back facts so that you can fix it. You're getting the other person to reflect back on where they've got to in their thinking. And then around the outside, you've got psychological safety. It's like that trust piece flow that it's conversational. 
curiosity killed the cat but unleashed the coach because if you're curious where's your focus it's on them yeah and context don't try and have a coaching conversation five minutes from the end of the day when the person needs to go pick their kids up from kindy so the 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 key uh landing point for all of this is those doing the thinking or talking are doing the learning and so as a coach as a manager that's coaching or a leader that's coaching you should be talking maximum 20% of the time, 80% should be in the person that you're coaching as they reflect internally or externally. And world-class coaches, it's more like 5% because they're just asking questions that nudge the thinking along. And the rest of the time, it's the coachee doing the talking. And you'll recognize all of these things, they're simply said, and anyone can do any of those. What a coach does is he he or she brings all of them to bear at the same time. So it's like a power magnifier on a conversation. And if the conversation doesn't end in an action, then it's called a chat. The whole point of the conversation was to trigger something different and to get the person to really own it. And if it was their idea, they're way more likely to follow through. So that's uh, four-day coach training in four minutes for you there, Campbell. Well, that's uh, that's that's brilliant. And uh yeah, for me, the it just reinforces that critical the critical piece is that it's all about them and not about you. That you're help, helping them to clarify their thinking, and you're doing that by being present and by asking questions, being curious, and listening carefully, and and nudging them based on what they're saying as opposed to the story that you've got going on in your head. So. Um, yeah, I, I may have missed some things there. In my, oh, but I, thought you, just, I thought you modelled coaching beautifully then. You just summarised back the absolute essence of that entire model. Beautifully done, Campbell. <laughs> so it does work. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've found that incredibly powerful and uh, it, it's just it's just amazing. And to, and to then, by doing that, you then turn down the advice, the advice piece and you're not, you're trying to get, them to work it out rather than you hopping in with advice that's perhaps premature. Uh, your technical advice can bring a lot to it, you know, around those technical conversations, and 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 that's a really powerful thing that you bring in with you. But the rest of it's about empowering the other people to 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 do it to do it for themselves. Well, so, the Mark, higher you go up, Campbell, right? The um, the least likely it is if you've employed or engaged teams of highly technically competent people across multiple disciplines, the chance of you being up to speed with the same level of thinking and doing and experience as all of your team in all of their disciplines is slim to zero. Yeah. You can never hope to know as much as all of the team combined in all of their individual specialisms. So you've got to ask them questions to help them think through what they would do because you can't possibly be into every aspect of every technical part of every person's role in your team. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was, uh, was it Steve Jobs that said uh, we don't employ really smart people to tell them what to do we employ them to tell us what to do right and so you, you want to be making use of that and then and then helping to pick out helping them to work them to work out what it is that you should be doing um yeah. just just to change the the flavor a little bit um one of the one of the big challenges with with new leaders is that they get often get put in they get taken out of a te- a role of technical expertise with often with not a lot of runway and then and then get put into a role and and often uh, left it's sink or swim. Go and do the job. We put you in the role. Off you go. Um, and it, and that leads to all sorts of bad outcomes potentially. And not too many, you know. And if you're not a natural leader, which a lot of people aren't, and if you look at the Gallup stats, it's only one in ten makes a natural leader. Some can be helped, but one in ten. Um, what can a leader of leaders do to help a new? leader in that new leadership role succeed because they can't do it all by themselves and there's a there's a real risk if you put someone into a role and leave them alone that they'll feel that whole what why am I here what am I doing what have I got to do and I've been there before um the imposter syndrome thing may kick in and yet a leader of leaders who understands how to support a new leader into a role and get them across that big chasm between where they were before of leading a team of people doing things into a leading a team of leaders. How, how do you how do you teach that or how do you help people understand what to do to support a new leader in that role? 
Yeah, and it's um, it's a bit of a blend. We often talk about the the push pull model. There are there are times early on in someone's career where you actually need to show them the ropes. Um, the what gets modelled gets mirrored. So as a senior leader early on, you want to spend some time helping set the guide rails expectations. Um, provide clarity around what the team's meant to be there to achieve, what's the role of the leader in achieving that, um, what you'd hope to see from them and what the plans would be and shape that together. You know, your your 90-day plans and then your, your two-year out plans and just be thinking what are the key measurables and outcomes. Um, but hold those lightly because they're a kind of a draft for then the, the leader that you're working with to engage with his or her team to understand and get their buy-in around. Um, of course, at some point, it will transition fully to coaching. He knew I'd go to that end at, uh, yeah, at a point. But coaching right from the get-go when they haven't got the guide rails can be um, incredibly hard for the individual because it's like, well, I don't know what I don't know. And if they're a technical background, they're used to being – um, clearly told what it is that needs to be done. Um, and if they don't know, then they can go and find out uh, through YouTube clips, through videos, through peers, through colleagues, they'll go and find it. But the, this enigma of leadership, you look up leadership on the internet, you get like one hit of two billion. It's like, well, which hell bit of advice do I take? So guide rails, clear expectations. In fact, if I boil it down to three things, um, a great piece of work and a, a book written by a guy called David Marquet, who's a, a submarine commander that empowered his submarine, the nuclear sub, which has got loads, loads of process regulations and everything else um, via using coaching. And um, he talks about um, the pillars and, and another guy talks about what, what I'd share, which is a, a simpler form, the, the success triangle. Triangle's got three sides. And one side is clarity, like what's the outcome? What does success look like? Create a definition of done, like where am I heading towards? Because if I don't know that, it doesn't matter how fast I go, I'm not going to get there. So clarity is one. Competence is the other. So what are the core skills that I need, the things I need to focus on as a leader to make that happen? And then the base of the triangle is motivation. So yeah, I might be really, really clear. I'm really, really capable, but I actually don't give a damn. <laughs> so you can use it as a coaching tool. You know, okay, give a one to 10 score on how clear you are about the outcome that you're trying to achieve here. Of course, if it's a six score, then right, what would what else do you need to bring it up to an eight or a nine? Again, one to 10 on your competence. How competent are you feeling? And sometimes this will be the, uh, they'll share a score, but then you'll kind of pick up the end, um, the underlying cues that they might be scoring themselves a little bit highly and actually they're a bit uncertain. Yeah. Cool. So what are the skills that they need to lean on and leverage? And if I'm coaching, I try and get them to reflect on times in their life, which might be at work or in their personal life, where they may have utilized those skills in different contexts before. Think about what the skill is and then just bring it to bear in this new context of the leader of the team. And then motivation again, you know, one to 10, are they buzzing to get this done or is it kind of the last thing that they ever want to do? And again, you can check in as to what's driving that. And it may be in the amount of times I've been on coaching com courses where people are like, I need to just deal with the difficult people that aren't performing. But we asked the leaders, you know, was there ever a time in your career where you were really struggling? And then what were the reasons why you were struggling? Now, they'll often won't put the technical skills of the job. It will be, uh, actually, my mum was in hospital, or yeah. we had some financial stuff going on, or one of my kids was ill. And that was detracting their attention from the stuff that they were doing because we're humans. Human beings, not human doings, right? And that's the whole point. So being supportive, allowing the leader to make some mistakes, showing them the ropes, um, and we'll often say, you know, model it, just walk them through, have them shadow you in a similar role, um, and then they get a feel for it and they build their confidence and then start to let them go. And like kids with riding a bike, you want them to graze their knee so they learn, but you don't want their first accident to be on a road with cars. Yeah. So how do you make those little mistakes learning points so that they can grow as a leader and don't smash them every time they make something or get something wrong? Instead, get them to reflect on what was working, what didn't, and what would you do differently next time. And then it all just becomes a learning journey.
Yeah, that's right. And and isn't it true that the stuff we learn the most from are the are the, are the big challenges, or or probably where we fell, you know, where we fell off and grazed our knee, um, but didn't kill ourselves, right? It's the <laughs> <laughs> and you so you start doing it because it hurts, right? Yeah, and so so that's the bit that is the best way to learn. And being told how to do it doesn't necessarily help us. Really, we might be able to do it, but we don't really get it. And um, it, it, there's a there's a lot of power in that. One of the, one of the things that I just picked up before Mark was a piece about it's you know their motivation. The motivation may have had to do with something else that was going on outside of their work life. So. Um, and that we're that there's that, that our, our life is built up of all of that, all of those parts, and work's a big part of it, but it's not the whole part. And if someone's not performing because I don't know, they you know, that their dad's sick, or you know, they're having their the child's sick, or there's some other issues going on in their life, they're having financial problems, then it's really difficult to to know that that's going on unless you know the people in your team really well. So, as a leader, one of the things that I've found really beneficial is to without being intrusive, obviously, is to get to know your team more than just who they are at work, understand a bit more about their life and what's important to them and who the other people in their life are and what's and what's going on and build an environment that makes it com- make them feel comfortable to come and talk to you if there are any other issues. Because if you're having a go at them for not performing and expect that it's because there's something wrong in their role, whereas actually it's got nothing to do with that, or their motivation's down, then you're missing out on a whole lot of opportunity to really um, build a connection, grow the the, the loyalty and, and and uh cohesiveness of the team and the people that are in it and 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 get the outcomes that you really want. Well, and they may you may be tarred with the brush of a previous manager that they experienced. And so their their own expectation is I'm going to be you know, over a barrel, constantly flogged to get more work done. And that may not be your approach at all. But if that's been their experience for 20 years, then they're automatically going to badge you with, here's another plonker going to be my manager. <laughs> and so you actually have to almost work doubly hard because you have to undo that. And what creates that trust is consistency over time. <clears throat> because being good like that for a week isn't going to cut it because you've got to go against 20 years of their previous experience. So you just, in my mind, find out what floats their boat. What are they really motivated to do at work and at home? And any conversations that you're helping them with in the relation to their role or their career, make sure you tie it back to stuff that matters to them. Because otherwise, it's you know, as far as they're concerned, you're just driving them as a, a piece of the, the cog in the wheel, right? Yeah. Um, you're just here to do a job. And uh, I don't know many people that turn up to work and go, you know what, today I'm going to do a terrible job. I can't wait. You know, Most people do want to do well at work. It might be hard to tell with some of the teams. but um, And often it's just circumstances, variables, things that are in play that have led to a point where they're now massively disengaged. And so your job is to help them to get engaged again. And the best yeah. way to do that, find out what they need and what floats their boat. Yeah, and it turns out that uh, the biggest impact on people's motivation and engagement at work is all around who they report to, who their direct direct report, you know, the direct lineup is. And if you're not looking after that as, as, a, as a manager and a leader, then you, you, you're missing out on so much. Yeah, people leave, uh, <laughs> leave managers, not organisations, right? Yeah. And often the reason cited is because they didn't feel valued. And that wasn't monetary value. It was just the boss took the time to know them and acknowledge them when a job was done well. And uh, bizarrely, that Gallup stuff you referenced earlier, seven to one acknowledgements in terms of positive versus the one, you know, the stuff that needs to be improved is what creates a balance in the mind of the employee. Seven to one. I mean, even one of their key questions is, I've had um, feedback, acknowledgement or praise in the last seven days. Well, I've worked with some people, you know, they're direct, they hadn't seen them for five years. (laughs) I mean, let alone being acknowledged, it's just one of the key criteria for engagement. Like, does my boss call out good stuff? And so, the role of the, the leader of leaders is management by walking about. Catch your people doing things well. Yeah. Don't walk around with a clipboard trying to catch them messing up because generally people aren't trying to be a complete nightmare. Yeah, and, and it so often happens, right? And and the the other piece around that is that oh, I can't I can't acknowledge too much, otherwise they'll just 
they'll just get used to it and expect it all the time. And if it's if you truly think that that's the problem, you're probably the other way around. It's probably seven to one against, not seven to one for. So and we're not just saying, you know, oh, good job for everything. We're talking about genuine reflection with specific feedback and evidence of you did X. What I really liked about it was this. So you're actually talking about what you've observed, not just the great job. So I still remember getting someone saying, oh, a fantastic job. And she'd say that to me, whether I made her a cup of tea or I did a three-month project. And so it had no validity. Yeah. What creates validity in feedback is that it's evidence-based around the person. And you're building that person up based on the job that you've seen them do. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah great job on the project. You delivered it on time. You've got the, the requirements right. You know, you engaged all, you know, the whole, all of that specifics around what it was. And you can go, oh, wow, okay, good. So that, you know, that was recognized. Mark, just before we, um, just before we wrap up, is there anything that I haven't asked you that I should have? Hmm. Or any final words that you, that thoughts that you might have that, that could help a new leader cross that chasm or their boss help them succeed? Uh, in a faster, easier way with less chance of failure. Yeah, I, I, I was still locked into the kind of question, what was it that you didn't ask? And it kind of ties into what we were just discussing then around, um, so what floats your boat, Mark? How come you do the stuff that you do? How did you, uh, how come you're passionate about all of this? And uh, I mean, apart from having worked with some, extraordinary leaders and some extraordinarily bad leaders. I mean, the impact of leaders on people in their work, but then that person in work, it then impacts their families, their communities, and kind of all aspects that they touch. You know, the role of the leader is even more important now than ever before. And in, in our mind, every human being has the potential to be great. So rather than leadership development, it's almost like human capacity development. The world's got so much stuff going on at the moment that's complex, that's challenging, that's um, that's difficult, that's hard to make decisions about. And so helping people to step up and be the best versions of themselves is the role that the leader can play to really support them. And a lot of what we're working with leaders on at the moment is the, <laughs> the old uh, adage from Air New Zealand is stick the oxygen mask on yourself before you help others. Um, you can only help other people if you're looking after you yeah. in terms of your own mental well-being. So checking in on how you're going, like one to 10 score, because as Nigel Latter said in a recent conference, it's too late when your score is down to a two out of 10, you're feeling rubbish to try and change things at that point because you're going to get shirty and in your fight-flight mode, you're going to be aggressive to someone or, or be the rabbit in the headlights. Instead, notice as you're drifting from like an 8 out of 10 down to the 5, notice that I'm at a 5 and then you can consciously choose to do something about it because uh, like coaching, awareness is the key to that choice and behaviour change. So if you don't notice you're getting a little bit ratty or hot under the collar, you can never make a choice to change it. So, yeah, that's one aspect. Leadership really matters. It makes a difference. And um, if you don't really care about the well-being of other people, probably don't put your hat in the ring for being a leader. Um, and then on the passion side for me, um, it's always about how do I inspire meaningful conversations worldwide? And the jump shift vision is about making a difference to a million leaders uh, in their work, their personal lives, and the communities that they serve. So, yeah, set people up for success. Be in service to helping them do the best work of their lives. Uh, and then you'll be the person that's remembered uh, for the value that I feel because my boss cares about me as a person. And man, that will make a huge difference, not only at work, uh, but in their ongoing impact uh, in the world. Brilliant. Mark, thanks very much. Great, great um, way to, to, to finish up. And the, the, the human piece of leadership just comes through so strongly with your approach and the, the, way you, uh, the way you do things. So thanks very much. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there I'd love to pick up again at some point with another conversation in the future. Uh, uh, maybe get you back on the show again. Anyway, it's been great. Really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. See you, see you next time. Yeah, likewise, mate. What goes around comes around. So no doubt I'll see you on my show at some point soon. <laughs> Cheers, Campbell. I look forward to it. See ya. Bye. Thanks for listening. 
If you have a friend or a colleague who would benefit from this episode, please pass the word along. If you have a friend or a colleague who would not benefit, but you haven't been in touch with them for a while, give them a call. iTunes reviews are great to get the word out and to help me create the show that's most useful for you. And if you're frustrated or having challenges or would like some help, guidance, assistance with your first leadership role, then check out integrationcatalyst.com in the link in the podcast notes below. Or pass this on to your boss to nudge them to get you the help you really need to cross the doing to managing chasm and get you powered up on your leadership and management journey. Oh, and if you want to make sure you don't miss an episode, hit subscribe. Until next time.